Well, good morning. I'm glad that you're here with us today. Even though this is a very different kind of service, as you can guess, we're all still trying to figure this out. I hope you're in the best place possible, because after all, you're in a place that you choose to live, and you're in a place where it's the people you choose to be with, and that's going to be a great place, and that's really what family is all about, and that's what God has designed. I think this may be a dream come true for a lot of people because for years I have been teased about, oh, well, I can do it from my living room, and now you can. Uh, a lot has changed this past week, as you know, and a lot has changed about this lesson because it was going to be a lesson about the time when we are able to share together the things that we have in common about how we are God's people and about how God's people work together. And it seems a little bit strange saying that to an empty church building. And so I want you to realize it isn't really the building. That's first. And especially since you aren't here, it isn't the building. But actually, you are here. And you are able to watch everything. The one thing that you may be uncomfortable about is you are sitting in the front row. And I know we could have tried to put you in the back, and that way everybody could have had a good back row seat, but just get over it. You're all in the front row. And so we want to talk a little bit about people of God today. And we're not even going to mention the fact that you just got out of bed 10 minutes ago and you're still in your PJs, but that's okay. I want you to know today that God is not canceled, that anything God decides to do is not canceled, that God answering prayers is not canceled. And even though we've had to go to some rather extraordinary measures about being able to worship today, God isn't canceled. God can be everywhere. And the odd thing is now we can be everywhere. And if God can be everywhere and we can be everywhere, I'm sure that this worship is going to be pleasing to him. So this is a series, we have talked about a holy God, we have talked about being dangerously holy, we have talked about called to be his holy people, and now we want to be talking about God's holy people. The other videos are up on the website if you want to watch those. Uh, but today we're going to be talking about God's holy people. And so there is a verse that uh, I want to read to you from 1 Peter. It says, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you might proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. And once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh, which wage war against your soul. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. And so as you think about the passage that he said, he gives us a lot of things about who the people of God are. And so he lists some of these things. We are a chosen race. We are a royal priesthood, not just an ordinary one. We are a holy nation. And a lot of those things we see people dividing over today. But God says, here is what I have been able to do for you. We are a people of his own possession. He is the one who wants to be with us. We proclaim his excellency because of what he has done. He has called us out of darkness into his marvelous light, not just ordinary light, but his marvelous light. He says, once we didn't belong, but now we do belong. We are people of God. And we understand that because we are identified by relationships. A lot of times when somebody doesn't know my name, or even if they do, they'll say, oh, well, that's Nancy's husband, or that's Lee or Joel's dad. And I stopped having a real name long time ago because those are the names that you adopt because they identify you by relationship. How great would it be to be people of God and that that's God's child and that that's the way people identified us? Because God does want us to be his people. And the fact that we can change our conduct so that our passion can be for good, not our passion for selfishness, or not our passion for sin. But we can use our passion for God so that he can 
allow others to see our good works and therefore glorify God. There were special people of God, and we read about those in the Bible, and there are a lot of times when we're able to see those people, people like Abraham, and so we're going to talk about just a few of those. Let me suggest to you today that this is very, very important for two reasons. One is because of the way that we love, and the second is the way that we face disaster as Christians. Those two things identify Christians as better than any other. Because those are where we shine the best. That we know how to love people and that we know how to face disaster. Those two things are are incredible. I don't want you to risk anyone else's health because of your faith. And so I appreciate you staying home today. We are not people who live in defiance to rules and claim our faith out of that. But we are people who know how to love and know how to face disaster. And if you think about the Bible, there are all kinds of places where people saw those two things together. In fact, when we start looking at the heroes of faith, we're able to see that there are a number of those people, and each one of them faced a different disaster. That seems to be what the book is made up of. Adam had a great deal in the garden that God had planted. He was placed there to take care of it. But then sin comes along and he eats of the tree and he's thrown out of the garden and that's a disaster. He's now got to work. He's now got to figure out life in a whole different way. Noah, on the other hand, was able to do everything that he could that was correct and right. It wasn't his own sin. But he has to face a worldwide flood. And as a result of that, he is the one who is able to face this kind of a disaster. He builds an ark. He is not only doing that, but he's saving two of every animal. It's an incredible project. I think what we're facing now is not near what other people have faced in the past. You read on in the Bible and you come to Moses. And when he was leading the people of Israel, they came to a sea. And God clears the way for them to walk across on dry land. What an incredible thing it is to realize this as you're able to see how these things work. God sent plagues, but they didn't touch his people. And so an army chases them and protects them and as God protects them as they cross the Red Sea. They go to a place where God is giving them the law and he protects them in their whole time as they travel through this wilderness and as they travel in this time. And they go to a new land that God is going to give them. They aren't perfect. And it would be nice if the Bible talked about people who were perfect and who did everything just right. But then we wouldn't identify so well, would we? But we understand what it's about. And we understand how all this works. Because the first thing they did was break God's command. And they worshipped idols. And they went after other things. And they didn't do things right. And so we understand that part also. It goes on to talk about great heroes of faith in spite of their sin and in spite of other things. People like David who is facing Goliath. That's a real disaster story, but it's a story about a battle and about a courageous young man. And all I have to do is mention the titles of a lion's den, and you're going to understand it's about Daniel and about his courage to be able to pray. And I want you to have that same kind of courage today. The fiery furnace, and you're going to know that it was because people were not going to bow down and worship another idol. Now, they didn't all develop into what God wanted. They were his creation. They had his law. But they didn't do everything that God said. And when we look at what it means to be a faithful child of God, some of them obeyed and some of them didn't. And so for a lot of them, God could not call them to be his people. He would rescue them and bring them back, and they could be God's people again. And then they would go away and and follow other idols, and we see that they didn't do it right. And today we're faced with a world full of people who are, frankly, not close to God. They've done a lot of things that are wrong, and, and we do a lot of things that are wrong as well. But the fact that you're watching this says that you're interested in God and you're interested in the things that God is doing and perhaps you're already a Christian. We have been far away from God at a time, but that's the greatest message today is we don't have to be. That we are able to 
be close to God, that we are able to be his people, and that life perhaps has been a disaster, but it doesn't have to be that way now because God is able to rescue us and God is able to make good things happen. We are to act like his people. We are to worship like his people. And when we make a covenant with God in our repentance and our baptism into Christ, then we are able to live this life and and be able to pray to God, be able to have the blessings of God. And he calls us his people, a holy people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. Life hasn't always been perfect. But there are some things I want to share with you today that might help us in being able to face this crisis. So to make it simple, there are three things, just so you know. I saw this. A gem cannot be polished without friction, nor a man perfected without trials. And we are in trials. There's no question about that. It's a time for strength, not a time for panic. And so I want you to be able to face this as we are God's people, whether we're separated from God or separated from each other or whether we're together. It would be great to have all of you here today. But I want you to know it's great to have all of you here today. That just seems weird, but that's the way it is. Number two, I want you to read your Bible. That means you need some spiritual input for yourself, for your children. It doesn't really matter how old they are. Be able to read your Bible with them. Be able to send them a scripture. Be able to text them something. Send them a passage that means something to you, but we all need spiritual input. There are things on our website, if you have not seen those, Ashby Camp has done a great deal of of extensive study and research, and so his site is listed on there as well. All of the sermons for the past year are listed on there if you want to go back and review those. There are things to do for kids. There are options available is what I'm trying to say. And it isn't that you don't have something, but now it's you that needs to do it. And no longer can you just bring your kids and somebody else does it. Number two, I want you to pray for things to change. And yes, I realize that's the second number two. But I figured you couldn't remember more than three things. And so the second number two is pray for things to change. Prayer changes you. It gives you courage to talk to God. It gives you a way to see that he answers. I think we need to pray more than ever. I had an elder call me last night and pray for me. And you probably did too if you're part of the Mesa Church. I have an idea they did a lot of that last night. I want you to know that there are people praying for you. Sometimes specifically, sometimes by name, sometimes generally. The passage that the elders have gone off of and mentioned specifically in all this time is in Philippians 2. And I want you to look at the passage and what it really talks about as far as how we're able to do things. He says, so that there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. What a great passage it is that it talks about all of these things together. And it talks about this great place of comfort and love and participation, having the same spirit, the same mind, the same thinking, and all of us being together. What a great place to be able to see how all of this works. But then he goes on from there. And he says in verse 3, Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. And so the third number two is be considerate of others. Right now that means don't go visit. That means call. And so that's an important thing. And we are working on things to give to you and things that will help you and uplift you. Please don't come to the building. Use your electronics. You paid a lot of money for that, those electronics, and so now is the time to be able to use those. We have a lot of ways to communicate. You can text. You can chat. You can do email. You can send a picture. You can make a video. You can go on Facebook, Instagram. Joel is doing a session on 
Instagram with his teens that's kind of a chat session. And so you might see if you want to join in on that, or maybe that's just for his teens. There's a time to learn about the smartphone that you've got in your pocket. You paid a lot of money for that. Make that thing work over time because you are not alone. There are ways to talk to people. There are ways to be with people. And maybe it's a call or maybe it's a text or maybe it's sending them something else. Members, give us your email and we'll be in touch. We are sending out things that will send you links. If you're not a member here, then check our website. Uh, those same things will be available there. And so I want you to realize that. God is always with us. And for the last passage in Romans chapter 8, I find this passage so encouraging when everything else doesn't work. Paul says, what should we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Jesus Christ is the one who died. More than that, who was raised? Who is at the right hand of God? Who indeed is interceding for us? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword or a COVID virus? Just add it on the end of the list. Nothing is going to separate us. He asked three questions. What do we say to these things? What we say is that God is with us. And that God is going to be with us through all of this. And that the disaster or the danger is not a threat to God at all. And it's not a threat to our relationship with God. Jesus is proof of that. Because Jesus is the one came. And it says God didn't even spare his own son. He's not going to let a virus come in the way in between us. He will graciously give us all things while we adapt to some of the changes. Who can bring a charge against us? God justifies. And even if there are things that we have done that are wrong, there is no one to condemn. And if they do condemn, then there is Jesus, the one who died for us, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who is interceding for us. And that's the answer to that question. It's not that people don't accuse. It's not that we've done everything perfect. But there is Jesus. And he is the one who answers all of that. And then he says, who will separate us from the love of Christ? Well, it's not going to be a disaster that separates us. And he gives you a long list of disasters. I think back to the few that I've been. I've been in an earthquake. I've been in hurricanes. I've been in blizzards. And I guess now a pandemic. So I'm adding to my list. And God has always been faithful through every single one of them. When the power is out, when things don't work, when services are shut down, this one's really pretty mild. It may seem like stores don't have everything you need. The power's not off. It's at a time of year when it's not incredibly hot and it's not incredibly cold. And Arizona, frankly, is a great place to be right now. And I want you to realize that God is always faithful. And so number three, yes, the first number three is God will never leave you. Stay faithful to him. That's what's most important. God's people know he took us out of darkness and into light. And so be strong and courageous. Don't fear or be afraid of them. For the Lord your God, he is the one who goes with you. He will not leave you or forsake you. God tells that to his people as he's leading them. He blesses us. And makes us like him. He even makes us holy. He has something better for you. A holy priesthood. A royal priesthood. A holy nation. A people that belong to him. In every trial we learn something. It is the main way you learn is by going through trial. People know that. We grow when we are under trial. We mature when we are under trial. We get better when we are under trial. If everything goes nice and smooth, then we usually don't have to think about anything. 
And we don't make improvements, and we don't get any better. And so just think about how good we're going to be once we get through all of this. Think about the things that you can do now and the way in which you're able to grow and the way in which you're able to share God's Word. I mean, use that phone, send a text, put something up. How much are we going to learn to trust God because of this? How much are we going to be able to fight? Even if it's just fighting your own emotions and fighting your own fear, or even if it's fighting with with Lysol and a Clorox wipe. I want you to know God keeps his promises. This is temporary. God has something better for us. And we are not helpless. There is a lot we can do with this. I want you to realize that. Do not feel helpless. We have a powerful God who is with us. And so here's what I want you to do. I want you to say a prayer. I want you to call a friend. And I want you to tell them that God loves them. That's it. Three things. Say a prayer. Call a friend. Tell them God loves them. Because then you're spreading the love of God.